Good, uh, good morning. Uh, welcome again to our third Thursday IHE Lunch and Learn. We are excited today to have Sandy Rankin with us. Sandy is well known in uh, Holocaust teaching circles. She has a, uh, though she wouldn't uh, toot her own horn, she has a, a national reputation in a, the most positive way. Whenever I meet other uh, other uh, educators, they always say, oh, you're from Nebraska, you, you must know Sandy Rinkin. And of course, at IHE, she's one of our uh, wonderful, wonderful uh, additions. And Sandy has been a social studies teacher at Freeman Public Schools in Adams, Nebraska for the past 29 years. Since 2004, she has taught a semester course on the Holocaust. She is a United States Holocaust Memorial Museum Teacher Fellow, Class of 2006, a Conference for Holocaust Education Center's Museum Teachers Fellow, and a mentor teacher for the Holocaust Museum's Teacher Fellow Program. In 2014, she was chosen to attend, and I will mispronounce the last name here, the, uh, the Olga Lengel Institute for Holocaust Studies and Human Rights, and joined their teacher education network. She also is one of the founding members of the Nebraska Holocaust Educators Consortium. When she's not in the classroom, Sandy enjoys traveling, running, and spending time with her new granddaughter. We welcome her today, her topic, the relevance of a Holocaust educator and how I became one. Welcome Sandy and we turn it over to you. Well, thank you so much for those very kind words, Scott, and for that introduction. And thank you for having me here today. I'm gonna to go ahead and share my screen here with you. Hopefully, there we go. There, hopefully you can see my screen now. Um, but I feel very privileged to be here today to talk to you about my journey as a Holocaust educator and some of the programs that I've been involved in, as well as why Holocaust education is still relevant today. One of the things that's become very relevant to me is how much, or very evident to me, is how much Holocaust education has evolved. Um, just like most people my age probably didn't have a lot of Holocaust education in their formal schooling. Uh, my only Holocaust education happened when I was in eighth grade and the teacher rolls in the, the VCR with the television on top and puts in a, a video. Uh, it was a very graphic video about the liberation of the, the camps and turns on the lights and says that was the Holocaust and sent us out the doors. Uh, and the same with, with college as well. None of my coursework in college dealt with the Holocaust. Uh, when I started teaching in 1993, my textbook might have had maybe a sentence or two about the Holocaust uh, within our World War II unit. I do teach 8th through 12th grade uh, American history and government. Uh, and there might be just a little bit about the Holocaust. And now we have a whole lesson on the Holocaust. So that's improved and changed a little bit. Um, in 2002, I received a flyer in my mailbox at school about the Belfer National Conference that was going to be put on by the United States Holocaust Memorial Museum. Uh, this conference is still ongoing today. Um, if any of you are interested, I would highly encourage you uh, to register for it. Registration will open in January and the conference itself will take place in late June. But this is really where my journey into Holocaust education began. Um, it's gone through many changes and with the pandemic, it went to an online format using the Whova app. But the morning is kind of pre-recorded videos with museum staff. And then the staff and museum teacher fellows will answer questions and give resources. And then the afternoon is when you have live Zoom sessions with Holocaust historians. And the last part of that uh, session will be with a museum teacher fellow where they will explain how to incorporate the information the Holocaust uh, historian just shared with you, how to incorporate that, rate that into your classroom and what resources and lesson plans the museum might have to help you. But I remember when I went to Belfer in 2002, I was extremely overwhelmed with my lack of knowledge. Uh, but very thankful that the museum staff met me where I was in my Holocaust journey. They really encouraged me. Uh, it was my first opportunity to meet with a Holocaust survivor, uh, and it really helped me to understand how important this history was and why I wanted to bring it back to my students. 
Um, I remember a very distinct moment uh, as part of this conference and I was uh, in the lecture hall there and Lisa Bauman from Oakland Park, Kansas was presenting. Uh, and she's done some work in Nebraska as well, um, but she's a museum teacher fellow. And I just remember being in awe of her. And it's like, this is what I wanna dedicate my professional career to. And so I decided I wanted to start a semester long course on teaching the Holocaust. Uh, the next two years, I really just engulfed myself in reading everything I could about the Holocaust. And in 2004, I talked to my principal and asked him if I could start a semester long Holocaust class. What I'd found in teaching history is we tend to cover a lot of subjects, but we don't really go into real depth on any subject. And I thought this was a topic that really deserved uh, that close look and would be good for my students. Uh, my principal agreed and suggested that I talk to our school board. So I gave a presentation to our school board. They also agreed. And so I was able to uh, start a semester long course. In order to help me get ready for that semester long course, I went back to the museum. Uh, they had a bell for two session at that time. And that's when I met Gretchen Skidmore. And Gretchen was a museum teacher fellow at that time. Uh, she's now the Director of Education Initiatives, and she really encouraged me to apply for the Museum Fellowship Program, uh, gave me some pointers on books to read and things that I should do to enhance my application. So that was kind of my next journey, um, is I applied for the Museum Teacher Fellowship Program in 2006 and was very thankful to be accepted. Um, it was a pretty daunting application process. Um, it's changed a little bit, I think, since I first did it, but I know it now includes a Zoom uh, interview as part of it. And it is a big commitment, but it is so valuable. Um, you'll spend about four days in Washington, D.C., and they pay the travel expenses, your hotel, most of your meals. You get a lot of different resources. And for this year's Museum Teacher Fellowship class, they're actually providing a stipend for those teachers um, because it is such a commitment that they're asking from them. Um, they bring in all kinds of scholars. It's a little more personal, or personal, I should say, than the Belfer Conference, because you're working in small groups. My museum teacher fellowship class was uh, a group of 12, and we still, 17 years later, still stay in contact with each other. Um, but they bring in renowned uh, Holocaust scholars. I got to listen to Tim Cole, who is an expert on the Holocaust in Hungary. Uh, Alexander Zapruder, who many of you probably recognize that name, uh, with the Holocaust Diaries. Christopher Browning came and talked to us. Now they bring in people like Wendy Lauer and Derek Black, but again, just an incredible opportunity to learn from Holocaust scholars. Um, you get to meet a lot more of the museum teacher staff, um, but you also get to work with people in the photo archives and people that work in the Genocide Prevention Center. And so you really do get connected to the museum when you participate in this program. Um, there's lots of discussion on pedagogy and teaching the lessons of the Holocaust. Um, they used to ask you to come ready with an idea of a project that you wanted to implement. Now they've kind of changed it more into promoting professional development and asking these teachers to go out and be leaders in their communities and promote Holocaust education and do teacher training in those programs. Uh, the year I was there, they decided to do something different. Uh, it was called lesson study. And they had us develop lessons for the Holocaust Museum. And the lesson that I developed along with um, Jenny Buchanan and Kira Aristad was our lesson was, should Auschwitz be bombed? And we used primary uh, source, primary resources. We used photographs, testimony, and we created this lesson where students would dive into this question and then answer it for themselves. Uh, but it was a phenomenal experience. The museum actually brought a photography team to my classroom, uh, which was really cool. And had people from Doan College and Death Beth Doton from the IHE came uh, to give feedback on the lesson and it was just a phenomenal experience. And once you do your, your first uh, week of Holocaust training with the museum, there's uh, sessions throughout the, the year that you work with them and then you return for a follow-up workshop 
that's a three-day workshop. One thing that I've kind of found with Holocaust education is that every opportunity that I've done has led me to another opportunity. And I just, for 17 years, I've just kept saying yes and have been very blessed with some of the doors that that has opened. Um, while I was at the Holocaust Museum during my fellowship year that to, in 2006, um, I had learned that Dave Neenkamp and Paul Smith, two educators in Nebraska, had gone to a regional Plains conference on Belfer and were going to have a meeting at Lincoln High that uh, August to try and bring all of the stakeholders in Nebraska that are passionate about Holocaust education and to bring them together to talk about how we could promote Holocaust education in Nebraska. Um, there were three museum teacher fellows at that time, myself, uh, David Neinkamp, and Pam Gannon. Uh, Beth Doton was the director of IHE at that time. She was there. They had Larry Starr from the State Department there, as well as some Holocaust uh, survivors. And at that time, we decided to form what was called the Nebraska Holocaust Education Consortium under the uh, umbrella of the Institute for Holocaust Education. Uh, the primary mission of the Nebraska Holocaust Education Consortium was to provide teacher training and materials to advance the knowledge and skills of teachers in Nebraska uh, and how to teach the universal lessons of the Holocaust. And we thought the best way to do this was through providing in-service to teachers. And so from 2008 to 2020, every year we had conducted Holocaust education uh, workshops for pre-service and in-service teachers on college campuses and universities around Nebraska. Um, then COVID hit, so we've kind of had a hiatus, um, but we're hoping to get back to rejuvenating this and doing it again here in the near future. And we've had many other teachers from the Nebraska uh, teaching profession join us in this mission. So once you complete your uh, fellowship with the Holocaust Museum, there's lots of other ways to stay involved. And as Scott mentioned, I've been fortunate to be a mentor for the past three years for the Holocaust Museum's uh, fellowship program. Uh, this summer will be my fourth time presenting or facilitating at their Bel Belfer National Conference. And another program that they have and that Scott is actually involved in as well is their Czech program or the National Conference for Holocaust Education Centers. Um, I've been a member of this program since 2017. Uh, Scott is also a member of the Czech program. Uh, you can see in this picture here, here is Scott at the museum in 2019 uh, with Kelly Watson, who was a museum teacher fellow that he was paired with. Um, the way this program works is the Holocaust Center would apply uh, to be a part of the program and the museum teacher fellows also apply to be part of this program. And then they bring you to Washington, D.C., um, and you get to tour the museum, you get to hear from historians, meet their education staff, learn a lot about the resources that the Holocaust Museum can provide. And the last couple of days of that conference, you work with a museum teacher fellow to try and figure out how you can bring resources back to your center and put on a Holocaust conference uh, and highlighting the museum as well as your center. And I just think it's been a wonderful program. I would guess Scott would agree. It's a, a tremendous program. And the real value I think of this program is it has created a network of Holocaust centers from across the United States uh, where they can share what's been successful, what challenges they've come across, how they meet those challenges. Um, but it really helps Holocaust centers feel like they're not in this work alone and they're not on an island. Uh, there's somebody they can go and talk to about this. We have a Facebook page and a Slack channel to kind of keep us all involved and uh, know what everybody else is kind of doing. And it's been a wonderful program to be a part of. Um, there's lots of other opportunities to uh, gain Holocaust education for, for teachers. Uh, there was a study done in 2013 in England of 2000 secondary education teachers. And what it found is that a lot of educators were unsure about how to teach the students about the Holocaust. And it's really difficult as educators to know how to teach effective lessons or teach sensitivity if you haven't been trained in how to do this, if you don't have the tools that you need to do this. Uh, the other thing the study found is that a lot of teachers, when they did teach about the Holocaust not having these tools, 
that a lot of times they were uh, teaching the Holocaust from perpetrator oriented narratives. Uh, they were discussing the actions of the Nazis rather than as the, the victims of the violence that they were talking about. As I said, every opportunity has led me to another opportunity. Uh, when I was at that founding meeting of the Nebraska Holocaust Education Consortium, I met Beth Doton, um, who was with the Institute for Holocaust Education at that time. And she was also a Echoes and Reflections trainer. And she said, hey, I'm going to be doing a workshop in a couple weeks. How about if you come to this training? And I said, yes. And it was an amazing experience. So Echoes and Reflections is another really good place for Holocaust educators uh, to find out about Holocaust education. Uh, one of the things I really like about Echoes and Reflections is they have incorporated the Shoah Foundations, uh, their testimonies of survivors. And I find that my students really find these testimonies relevant, especially when it's getting harder to bring survivors into the classroom. Um, it's just a, such an important piece of this history. Um, Echoes and Reflections also does a lot of online webinars today. I've been able to take part in several of those um, and just phenomenal resources for educators. Uh, another good resource is the ADL. Um, the ADL actually came to my classroom and uh, did a program for my eighth graders called No Place for Hate several years ago and did a phenomenal job with those students. And I know they learned a lot from that program. Uh, Facing History is another excellent program. They do a lot of online classes and things as well. I've taken a Holocaust and Human Behaviors class with them. Uh, they are anti-Semitism class. They have a class on the Weimar Republic. That's been a phenomenal program and a place to get Holocaust information as well. And I think it was about a year ago, maybe a little over a year ago, um, that you had Mark uh, come, Mark, uh, come and do a presentation, a lunch and learn for you to talk about his book. And he talked about the Martin and Doris Rosen Summer Symposium and at Appalachia State. And I was one of those teachers that went with Mark as, and a couple other teachers to this program. They usually host a conference in late August, or sorry, late July. That's another phenomenal program for teachers. Uh, and one of the things that I really learned at that conference is to talk about Jewish culture and traditions. Um, they did a Judaism 101 day when we were there. Um, and you know, a lot of my students have never met anyone who is Jewish. And so that's something that I learned that became very important to me. And that it's also important for our students to learn about pre-war Jewish life so that they see Jews as not just as victims. Uh, one of the, the lessons that I incorporated with my students since then is I have them search the Holocaust Museum's uh, archives and try to find pictures of pre-war Jewish life and then look at their own family albums and try to find pictures of them doing things and then pair those pictures together. Uh, and I found that's been really valuable. One of my students was really into FFA and showing pigs at the state fair. And she had a picture of her showing her pigs at the state fair. And on in the archives, she actually found a young Jewish girl with her pigs and you know, paired those together. It helps us to make those connections, uh, to know that Jewish people were real people who had, you know, they felt about their lives the same way that we feel about our lives. And I think that's a really important piece of this history. Uh, and that came to me from that conference. As Scott mentioned, I was also uh, joined the Tolley organization, the Ogolingual Institute. I went to New York City and studied there for about a week. Um, they have a little different perspective on the Holocaust, which I really appreciated. Um, they do a lot with writing and journaling, which was something I wasn't real familiar with. And I learned the value of writing and process to help students process uh, the information. They also talk a lot about the humanities and incorporating the humanities into Holocaust education. And they're also taking more of a social justice perspective now as well. Uh, when I was at this particular conference, I learned about the Tulsa race riots. This was 2014, and I had never heard of this historical event, even though I was a history teacher. Um, and so that was a very relevant program for me to be a part of. Uh, another program that's really, really good and I learned about this from a museum teacher fellow. I'm fortunate to know Todd Hennessy. 
And he's been working with Father Patrick Dubois and Yohad and Unum. If you're not familiar with what the work that Father Dubois is doing, it's just phenomenal. Um, he is going into places like the Ukraine, going into these villages. He's interviewing people who were there at the time of the Holocaust, asking them about what they saw, what happened there. He's, you know, can you show me where this happened? Can you take me to the mass grave? And documenting this history and has created this website called In Evidence. And this, this map just has all kinds of little dots on it. And each one of those is a place where the Holocaust took place. Um, he's also cross-referencing what he has found. He's videotaping these uh, survivors. And then he's cross-referencing it with the uh, German archives and with the Soviet archives and creating a really, you know, just phenomenal website where we as teachers can use this to bring this history into our classrooms. So again, there's lots of opportunities out there for teachers, lots of programs to help you teach this uh, history in a very sensitive and responsible way. Another thing that I think is really important to learn about Holocaust education is to travel. Um, I actually am going to be taking my students to Washington, D.C. Uh, 18 students are going to be going with me in early November. And I won't talk a whole lot about Poland because I know Scott did a lunch and learn last week on or last month, sorry, on Poland. Um, but I was very fortunate to be part of a program that was funded by the Polish uh, Embassy, their cultural exchange program. And they talked to the Holocaust Museum and asked them for some names of some teachers that they thought might be good to pair with some teachers from Poland. And they wanted to bring us to Poland where we could meet and we could tour some historical sites together and maybe you know, collaborate and learn to create lessons together uh, and how to teach this history a little more responsibly. And that was another phenomenal program. Um, it was the year of Jansus Korzak. So we, this is the orphanage where Jansus Korzak uh, was. And we actually walked the same path that Jansus, uh, Jansus, uh, Jansus Korzak would have walked with his children on their way to the Umschlagplatz. That was very moving to walk that same path and learn about the history. Uh, we went to, over here to the Warsaw Ghetto, or sorry, to the Warsaw Cemetery. We went to Treblinka. We went to the Warsaw Rising Museum and, of course, to Auschwitz. But travel is a really great way to learn and to bring this information back to your students as well. Another travel experience I had the opportunity to, to go on uh, was to go to Rwanda. And again, this is because of one connection leading to another connection. Um, I met a museum teacher fellow who told me about Carl Wilkins. Carl Wilkins was the only American to, to remain in Rwanda during the 1994 uh, Rwandan genocide against the, the Tutsi. Um, it was a very humbling experience. Uh, it made me you know, very fortunate that I was born in the United States. Um, just very uh, humbling experiences, about all I can, can say with that. Uh, but I met this little girl and I went to her home and it was just, you know, an adobe home with two rooms. They had little mats on the floor to sleep. They had a pile of pots, uh, a fire outdoors to cook. And, you know, they had so very little, but they are such generous people. And her mother's like, here's some bananas. You're our guest. You have to, to, to take something from us. And just the, the people are just so resilient and so uh, generous, as I said. Uh, we went to see where the Belgians, uh, the memorial to the Belgian soldiers that were killed there. We visited Niamata, uh, Marumbi, and these were just overwhelming experiences for me. Uh, as you can see, uh, one of my friends took this picture of me after going to Marumbi and just overwhelmed uh, with this history. We also visited some schools, which was very interesting. Uh, this young lady, this was at Gashora Girls School, and each a uh, person that was there, we were paired with one of the girls and she took us around the school and got to know them. And that was just phenomenal as well. Um, another place that we went was a reconciliation village where they have perpetrators of the Holocaust might be living alongside someone who's, you know, a family member that they may have killed and how they're dealing with forgiveness and how they're working through this history. Uh, we went to a Tiege camp, 
and got to visit with uh, people that had perpetrated the genocide. Um, I got to meet, Dem actually I had met Damascus Simba previously when he was in the United States at the Belfer National Conference. But this is Carl Wilkins here with Damascus Simba. Uh, Carl Wilkins was at the, the um, at his orphanage and he saw the people committing the genocide coming and he was filling up his water bottles. So he tried to fill up his water as slowly as he could. He was afraid to leave, afraid of what might happen if he left. Um, but eventually, he, you know, he did have to leave. And so he went into Kigali and he met with one of the leaders of the genocide. And he told them, hey, I just came from the orphanage. I see that there's soldiers coming there. I'm very concerned. And the perpetrator of the genocide, the leader of the genocide told him, I'm aware of that situation, but you don't have to worry. The children will not be harmed. And because Carl went and talked to him, the children at this orphanage were saved and just phenomenal experience, as I said. Um, one of the things also that I learned at Rwanda is that we should always try to look for the good. Um, Rwanda does not want to be defined just by the genocide just as we don't want to be defined by our worst day as well. And there's a Rwandan saying that says that what you do next is what defines you. Uh, and so they're trying to rewrite their history a little bit. Um, we went to, on an African safari. The sunsets are just absolutely beautiful there. And then in this picture here, I met Emmanuel Habiamana. Um, I did not realize Emmanuel had actually done, had actually studied at the University of Nebraska in Lincoln. I had to go all the way to Rwanda to meet him, and he's become a really good friend of mine. But he did a film called Kamora, which means to heal, uh, that got picked up by National Geographic. And it's an ex excellent documentary about his experience and his family. And that would be another good resource to use in your classroom. So my students often ask me, you know, why are we studying about this event? It happened so long ago. Why is it relevant today? And, you know, even 77 years after the liberation of Auschwitz, the Holocaust is still relevant today. It intersects with so many social issues. Uh, it impacts how we combat racism today. Uh, Anti-Semitism is still present. Um, I do a, a lesson with my students where we look for current day incidents of anti-Semitism. And in 2004, when I started teaching my class, it was kind of hard to find these incidents. Uh, we might have to look to Europe or to France, you know, France in particular, we'd find some. But this year when I did this with my students, it was like three minutes on the internet and the kids had all kinds of incidences of how anti-Semitism is still around today. Mark Twain is often quoted as saying, history doesn't repeat itself, but it often rhymes. And a lot of our history our, from our past does rhyme with the present. And a lot of that is because human nature hasn't changed. Uh, this is an audit that was done by the ADL showing anti-Semitic incidents in 2021. Um, incidents occurred in all 50 states. Uh, and this, it's been a 34% increase in anti-Semitism since 2020, and it's the highest number on record since the ADL began tracking anti-Semitism in 1979. And so this does show why this history is still relevant today. Um, we still have events like Charlottesville. We still have events like the Tree of Life Synagogue. Um, and so, again, it, it's very re relevant to our students. Another thing that we're seeing is a rise in Holocaust denial. This picture was actually taken uh, from one of Seattle's largest synagogues. And here in this, you can see um, the S's are dollar signs. Um, again, showing a lot of that anti-Semitism still relevant today. Some of those old stereotypes about Jews still relevant today. Um, Holocaust denial. Um, is that, you know, saying the Holocaust never happened, or maybe it was completely made up to benefit Jews and to benefit Israel. Um, another thing that we're seeing, uh, besides the rise in threats uh, for Jewish community centers and cemeteries across the country, uh, we're also seeing a big rise in Holocaust distortion. Uh, Holocaust distortion is a way of attacking the Holocaust memory. It's chipping away at the facts 
uh, minimizing the numbers, things like it wasn't really 6 million people, or maybe minimizing the role that Nazis played, their collaborators played. Um, and it's using imagery and language associated with the Holocaust for political, ideological, or even commercial purposes unrelated to this history. And when we saw COVID, we saw a lot more of this, uh, a lot of equating, you know, COVID to the Holocaust and wearing a mask is like the Nazis. And we've, again, this is very disturbing to see some of this. Um, one of the things I think is really important is that we teach students about this. Uh, one of the lessons I did in my classroom recently, and I did this with seniors, I don't think I would do this with, you know, younger students, definitely. Uh, but it's a, a lesson that comes from the Holocaust Museum, and it's analyzing memes. And so we looked at Holocaust memes, and just there, some of them are just absolutely atrocious. And I think it was an important lesson for my students to see what's out there. And, what, and we also talked a lot, you know, why did they create this, and why is this inappropriate? Um, I think that if we don't teach students this history, we risk people not having enough historical context to understand why this is wrong, um, why you shouldn't be doing the Nazi salute and making jokes about it, or why you shouldn't be taking selfies at places of memory. Um, it's We owe it to the survivors to, to teach our students uh, that they can do better and they must do better. One of the things also I'm very thankful about is to be a teacher in Nebraska. I know that there are a lot of states where you cannot talk about slavery and you can't talk about Holocaust history. And I, I'm not gonna read this all to you. You can see that there, but our standards in language arts and in history have been written very broadly. And you can bring Holocaust education into your classrooms because of the way they have written these standards. Um, you can choose which texts that you want to read. Uh, what topics you want to research and have students write on. Um, it's the same way with the social studies standards. Um, I teach American history. So these are some of the American history standards, you know, using multiple perspectives, teaching about different cultures and ethnic groups, talking about events from perspectives of marginalized or underrepresented groups. And I think it's important for our students to realize that if you had a different experience, you might have a different perspective on this history. And that's written right in our, our history standards right here. And the other thing I really like, this is straight from the history standards. They said, for example, talking about religious, racial, ethnic groups, immigrants, you can talk about the refugee crisis. You can talk about how we didn't bring immigrants into the United States uh, after Crystal Knock, those type. Of, it's all right there in our standards. Uh, and again, it's, it's here too. It's using oral histories and written documents, using the inquiry process to answer historical questions. You can ask students to, you know, why the Jews or how did the Holocaust happen and have them do research on these things. And you're backed up by the Nebraska standards, which is really good to have. Um, as you know, the Never Again Act was signed in May of 2020. Um, this act actually provides $10 million of funding to the Holocaust Museum over the next five years uh, to talk about and to improve uh, Holocaust education. They've hired two new staff members to help with this, and they've also been working a lot with their Czech partners and people like Scott uh, on, you know, how to get resources into classrooms, how to make sure classrooms have classroom sets of night and and Frank. And so that's been uh, a really good for Holocaust education. And then Nebraska in uh, April of 2022, 40 to one, so pretty overwhelmingly, passed uh, Nebraska state mandate LB888, uh, which manda mandates Holocaust education for teachers in Nebraska. And so I know there's a group of teachers working on this. I know the IHE is working on this about how we can provide resources to help teachers meet this Nebraska state mandate for Holocaust education. Um, and then of course, the US and the Holocaust film is coming out uh, on Sunday. Scott and I were very privileged to be on a Zoom call uh, with Ken Burns just the other day. Um, but this will be airing on Sunday night and it's a three segments, they're two hours each. It will air Sunday. And as Scott and I were talking before the program, um, they will not be airing the, the second episode on Monday night because of 
uh, in respect to the queen and her funeral being that day. And so the second episode will air on Tuesday night and the third episode on Wednesday night on PBS. And Ken Burns has said that he will not work on a more important film. He's been working on this for seven years. And this, I have to explain a little bit about this photograph over here. Um, I was at the Holocaust Museum in 2018 and I was sitting there waiting for early access and I'm looking around and all of a sudden here comes Ken Burns. And I, you know, I grab my phone and I'm trying to figure out how to get my, this is the picture I got. By the time I finally got my phone out and ready to go, Ken Burns and Gretchen Skidmore were already behind the memorial, <laughs> but I had to share that photo. I did get to see him kind of in person uh, when he was at the Holocaust Museum. Um, but I think this history, I mean, this, this film's gonna be phenomenal. Um, it's going to allow us to, to think about our past and the wrongdoing in our past um, and you know how to make sure that we can prevent it, that it doesn't happen again. Uh, we can ask ourselves questions like who we are as a country, who we are as individuals, and to stop and think about how we can do better. Um, even though the United States did accept more refugees than any other country in the world, there's things we probably could have done different. We could have yelled louder. We could have publicized more. Uh, we could have tried to make the, the world more outraged about this, but allows us to stop and think a little bit. So the next thing, it's, I've got a really short 30 second clip uh, about the um, documentary that Ken Burns is doing that I think that you guys will enjoy here. I think Americans have a very hard time deciding what kind of country they want to have. We all tend to think of the United States as this country with the Statue of Liberty poem, give me your tired, your poor. But in fact, exclusion of people and shutting them out has been as American as apple pie. Okay. Sorry here, <laughs> technical difficulty there. Um, by facing our history, um, students examine a lot of the pivotal moments uh, they learn about choices made in the past that have shaped our present. Uh, our students come to understand that history is not inevitable, that people make choices and choices make history. And we owe it to the 11 million people that were murdered among those 6 million Jews who were murdered during the Holocaust to teach this history and to tell their stories. And as Ken Bird says, as human beings, let's not get there again. So thank you very much for, for having me here today. And I'm happy to answer questions if there's questions. Yes, there will be in a second. If I could just ask if you would just stop sharing your screen. Okay, sure. Oh, go no, back no. into there. Um, there should be. Uh, yep, yep, I just, ah, there we go. <laughs> Sorry. All right, thank you. Um, we did have one question. First of all, the name of the movie uh, that you mentioned about Rwanda. Can you oh, just sure. give that it, name again? Sure. It's Kamora, K-O-M-O-R-A, Kamora and to heal is the, and I think you can find that on YouTube. And we had a question about, have you, have you taken any of your classes? I don't recall to, uh, to our exhibit and program that we have at the SAC Museum. Have you been able to take part in that? I, I have not. I've been to there, but I've not taken my students yet. That's a really good suggestion. I should bring them to the SAC Museum because that's a wonderful exhibit. That's I'd be happy to talk to you about that offline. Steve Weiss uh, suggested that. Um, you said um, what you do next. So as far as your quote there and and actually, um, uh, you know, there's there's so much out there. Um, I'm I'm very grateful. Actually, if one of the things that came from uh, from COVID is that Belfer now for the third summer was done uh, digitally uh, as opposed to having to be there. And actually uh, the thousands more teachers got to participate as a result of it. But what's next for you? Well, I, I've been kind of playing and toying around with the idea of going to Yad Vashem and going to a workshop there and learning more about the Holocaust in Israel. So that's kind of on my bucket list. Well, that's where a lot of my training comes from, and I'd be happy to 
to put you in touch. I know you know people there too, but their, their seminars also are absolutely wonderful and uh, very insightful. Um, Dana, please go ahead. Yes, um, partially my big question was answered by the Nebraska standards, but I was wondering, you know, Scott, also when you go in uh, with speakers, do you get pushback about saying that uh, America had a lot of lapses in closing off the immigration? You want to take that first, Sandy, and I'll, I'll answer what happens on our end. Okay, sure. Um, I, th I think that a lot of times they do talk about that, but what they've, they kind of tend to blame Roosevelt for that. Um, but what they don't realize is that's also Americans are at fault for that also. That's kind of what Americans wanted. Uh, at the Holocaust Museum, they have uh, some uh, Gallup polls that they have done and how after Crystal Knock, even after we knew what was going on, they asked, do Americans, should we let more Jews into America? And it was pretty overwhelming that no, they did not want to allow uh, Americans or uh, sorry, Jewish people into America. So I think we as, as people are also have to share some of that responsibility. Yeah, I saw that exhibit and it's also online. Yeah, and right. there was a traveling exhibit at Nebraska Wesleyan uh, last fall. I think the documentary is going to be very interesting to see what questions come out of it more in the, you know, that us having to face as Americans, um, our own role or lack of role in it. And so the discussion is going to be very interesting. I think for Holocaust educators, always we try to do things without pointing fingers, but providing information and having discussion. And I think that we get a lot further that way, but this topic is one that absolutely needs to be investigated. And I think that um, we're going, I, what, I, what I was feeling right now, actually I said this to Sandy, I've said this to other people, what Schindler's List did for Holocaust education in the 90s, I think that this new documentary from Ken Burns is going to do that in, open up a whole other area for us to look at and is going to really increase um, the, the want to, to look at what we did or didn't do or what we should have done. And the other part of it is that there's not just one person or one group to point a finger at, it's, it's universal, including there's, there's articles coming out right now about the Jewish community's response. So this is there's going to be a lot of, um, I hope, very interesting discussions, and that we're going to learn from it, as opposed to be accused to to be pointing fingers and accusing. What do you think, Sandy? No, I, I think you make a very good point there, Scott. That you know we shouldn't be pointing you know fingers in this history, and hopefully learning from past mistakes and how we can move forward as a country and as a people and make things better. Any other questions here? Sandy, what is your next, I mean, other than Yad Vashem, I mean, what do you see? Um, do, you, do you see in, in your, your classrooms now that as a result of things like Ken Burns and some of the other things coming out, uh, Derek uh, Brown's you know, presentation, do you see the ability to talk about extremism in, in a different way? with uh, in, in educational systems? I feel very fortunate to do that. In fact, I shared some of Derek Black's story with my students. He is a uh, person that grew up in white nationalism and left the white nationalist movement. In fact, his family did Stormfront. Uh, and, you know, David Duke was his godfather. And, and he was you know, actually but, hired to do all the social media for- Right, around that. and. My students found that very interesting and I don't make connections for them, but my students have been able to make connections as to why this history is still relevant and still ongoing today. Do you, are, let me ask you a kind of a little bit charged question. Um, we are, as far as educationally, LB888, um, we're actually kind of grateful with the way it was phrased, meaning that the general aspect of it, because especially because it leads into the standards, but it leaves open uh, teacher's ability to actually develop teaching as opposed to be just giving facts and, and figures. What, what do you think about the, the, 
the terminology of legislation. I, I really like that also. It gives a lot, you know, Nebraska is very much a local control kind of state. And so I like the idea that teachers can develop where their strengths are and teach that. Um, the one downside, I think, is if you are an educator that doesn't have a lot of expertise in this area, um, it could be a little daunting and a little difficult. And that's why I'm thankful for groups like the IHE and places that I know are putting together some resources to help those teachers that might not know where to turn because it is so open. And just so you know, as a group, we we look at it absolutely as relation building, that it's that it takes all of us together in order to make this happen and not to say, oh, well, that's our area to do. That's not our area. So for example, uh, Jane, our new education coordinator and Sandy and a couple others were meeting the other day and we've had some ongoing meetings as far as how we're going to address those areas in, to, to meet the needs of teachers. And I'd venture to say in the next month or so, we're gonna be hearing a lot more from teachers because of Ken Burns. Steve, did you, Steve Weiss, did you have a question? You had your hand up before. Well, I, uh, I want to, first of all, thank Sandy for an outstanding presentation. Uh, it was uh, very helpful for me. Uh, gave me some additional information I didn't have ac access to before. A couple other sources that are very useful for uh, current Holocaust education, Classrooms Without Borders. And uh, I don't know if you're aware of FASPA, Fellowships at Auschwitz for the Study of Professional Ethics. Thorsten Wagner is the executive director. They have outstanding online uh, Zoom sessions from a variety of perspectives, uh, well worth uh, participating in. And my last comment, uh, uh, I would echo Debbie Lipstadt that uh, currently Holocaust distortion is a much bigger problem than Holocaust denial. I think Holocaust denial uh, after uh, her uh, 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 victory at the trial has largely uh, been put on the back burner, but Holocaust distortion is a very serious and uh, unfortunately exploding problem now. Yeah, I would agree that? with that, that my students were just overwhelmed when we, we looked at what was out there. And it, it's scary to look at the internet and the things that are out there. Do you think that there's two types of distortion? And what I mean by that is there's the malicious distortion that's done by people who harbor prejudice, anti-Semitism, those types of things. And then I think one of the things Sandy and I uh, uh, and Jane see that needs to be addressed is that sometimes teachers don't know what they don't know. So meaning that they use materials, uh, fictional materials that distort, they don't maliciously distort the truth, but they distort the truth as to what actually happened. And I'll give the example of, um, and, I, and every Holocaust educator has had this happen. Um, somebody will say, oh, in my class, I use the boy in the striped pajamas. And the boy in the striped pajamas is a fictional story that was turned into a movie of factually never could have happened and never would have happened. And you know, I've had discussions with teachers and they, they're very proud that they use it. And then we have to have a discussion of here are some sources you could use and then why we would hope that they in the future would use those sources as opposed to the other. H have you found that at all in your as a museum fellow and you're reaching out into other communities? I would say that that's very true. And teachers don't do that intentionally, as you mentioned, they just don't know better. Um, and, you know, just like my teacher that showed me this very graphic video, I think at the time, you know, he just didn't know better. And I think we run into that a lot, which is why Holocaust education for teachers is so important. You know, it's interesting what you also said when you opened with about why you went into the study and your experiences as a, as a, uh, a person who was born and raised Jewish. That's, those are the experiences I actually had in, in the circles of the 70s being taught about the Holocaust. And it actually is what pushed me into wanting to study it differently because I didn't feel that either it was too graphic and there was no there was not a purpose to it or 
we weren't there wasn't any explanation so it's interesting that uh that on on your end you saw it that way too yeah steve do you have something you want to say yeah i uh would really encourage sandy and you to have discussion about uh, field trips up uh to the uh, sac museum like we've been doing uh, i've done a number of talks there and i i think my re my read of the reaction from the students and certainly there are a lot of teachers some of which have been at several of my talks uh it, it's in, uh, very very positive it has great great impact and i think a field trip up there not only to view the museum but to hear myself or uh, hazan Kraussman or another speaker would be well worth it um i agree i appreciate that suggestion that's a really good idea and we will have that conversation. Sandy and I talk all the time. Yeah. We're actually on a lot of the same meetings nationally, but um, we'll, I, I agree with you, Steve, I think. And we actually, uh, Jane and I were just at the museum yesterday. Uh, Jane being brand new in our, our program, I was taking her through and we met with the staff there. So we're ready to go in the middle of October. Yeah, the other uh, thing. Dana, the, the uh, museum exhibit is really geared towards middle school and uh middle school and above and and most of the the i would say we we get um middle school and ninth graders a lot through it um and dana is is uh actually going to be one of our our next uh, she's going to be presenting her family story uh in november our lunch and learn and hopefully we're going to be bringing her in as part of our second generation speaker core um I will be inviting you to actually see when once we have the dates to come out to the museum to see what we do there. Uh, Scott, if I might uh, bring up one other suggestion for you and uh, your, your colleagues to consider, uh, Gerald Steinacher in his genocide class uh, and his, Holoc his Holocaust class, he uh, takes his students to synagogue in Lincoln. And I think if that's possible, we should consider doing that, the, not just in Omaha, but I don't know how far Sandy's town is from Lincoln. I think we're showing images of synagogues and Jewish life. And I think it might help bring it from the abstract to uh, reality uh, by actually visiting a synagogue. And, uh, and those, those things are possible. And Sandy, if you're interested in your in your uh, community, we can help. We can help facilitate that to help. I am about twenty-five miles from Lincoln, so I, I do appreciate that suggestion. The, the also. rabbi for the community there, Rabbi Alex, is a wonderful, wonderful uh, educator. Actually, the other thing that's interesting in his story is his wife is from the Ukraine and um, has been doing some speaking on on experience. But um, again, thank you, Steve, for that. And Sandy, we can we can help to make that. I can help make the introduction and make that happen. Oh, that would be phenomenal. We have a lot to talk about, Scott. <laughs> yes, we do, as always. But that's great. That's. Uh, are, are there any other questions? Well, next, first of all, Sandy, as always, thank you. And and um, it, it's really Sandy is very very laid back and doesn't like to toot her own horn. But mm -hmm. I am not exaggerating that whenever I am at something and and I say, well, I'm from, you know, Omaha, Nebraska. They say, oh you must know Sandy Rankin and um, she is has a national reputation as a teacher and is a gifted gifted member of our community and so we thank you very much for speaking today. Uh, next month we have another one of our wonderful teachers Becky Zanardi who's also going to be doing some other work with us but she is going to be talking about upstanders and rescuers some work that she's been doing with it and I think you'll find it very interesting and then in November uh, Dana Knox is going to be speaking uh, on uh, uh, her family story um, the uh, as far as um, Gary I'll be very happy to give you I'll send you an email with Sandy Rankin's uh, contact information. Gary used to live in the Lincoln community. He's now out out east. Um, and uh, actually, you can see her email right there. And uh, uh, again, I thank you all for being here. For those, uh, Gary, just I know you jumped in late. Um, we will be posting this in the next few days on the Jewish Federation of Omaha's YouTube page. So I would thank Sandy for allowing us to record it. Thank you all for being here. And I look forward to seeing you all, I hope next month.
Great. Thank you all so much. And thanks so much, Scott, for having me. Pleasure. Thank you.